This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 39. Coming up on Space Time, how heat affects the Earth's magnetic field, NASA's Parker Solar Probe kisses the sun, and indirect evidence for the existence of dark matter surrounding black holes. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Compass readings that don't always show the direction of true north and interference with the operations of satellites are just a few of the problems caused by peculiarities within Earth's magnetic field. The planet's magnetic field radiates around the Earth and far into space, but it's all set up by processes happening deep within the planet's core, where temperatures exceed 5,000 degrees Celsius. New research reported in the journal Nature Geoscience suggests that the way the super-hot core is cooled is key to understanding the causes of the peculiarities, or anomalies as scientists call them, of the Earth's magnetic field. In the extremely hot temperatures found deep inside the Earth, the planet's core is a mass of swirling molten iron which acts as a geodynamo. As the molten iron revolves, it generates Earth's global magnetic field. Convective currents keep the dynamo churning and turning as heat flows out from the core and into the mantle, a layer of rock that extends some 2,900 kilometres up to the planet's crust. Scientists have found that this cooling process isn't happening in a uniform way across the planet, and these variations are causing anomalies in Earth's magnetic field. Seismic analyses have identified regions of the Earth's mantle, primarily under Africa and the Pacific, that are especially hot. And computer simulations have now revealed that these hot zones are affecting the cooling of the planet, reducing the cooling effect on the core, and this causes regional or localised changes in the properties of the planet's magnetic field. For example, where the mantle tends to be hotter under Africa, the magnetic field at the top of the core is also likely to be far weaker and this results in a weaker magnetic field projected out into space above the South Atlantic Ocean. And that, which scientists call the South Atlantic Anomaly, causes massive problems for orbiting satellites. The study's lead author, Jonathan Mound from the University of Leeds, says one of the things that the magnetic field in space does is deflect the charged particles which are constantly streaming out from the sun. But where the magnetic field is weaker, that protective shield isn't as effective. So when satellites pass over this South Atlantic anomaly area, these charged particles can interfere and disrupt with their operations. In fact, NASA needs to shut down the Hubble Space Telescope whenever it's orbiting over the South Atlantic anomaly. And crew aboard the International Space Station also experience computer glitches when they're orbiting over the anomaly. Scientists have known about the anomaly over the South Atlantic ever since they began monitoring and observing the magnetic field. But what's not known is whether this is a long-term feature or something that's just happened more recently in the history of the planet. As the lead study has revealed, these anomalies are likely to be caused by differences in the rate at which heat is flowing from the Earth's core into the mantle. The whereabouts in the Earth's inner structure these heat flow differences happen is likely to dictate how long they could last. Mound says the processes in the mantle happen very slowly, so we can expect to see temperature anomalies in the lower mantle, which have stayed the same for tens of millions of years. Therefore, we can expect to see properties in the magnetic field they create have also been similar over tens of millions of years. But the hotter outer core is likely to be a dynamic fluid region. So, the heat flows and the magnetic field properties they cause would probably fluctuate on shorter timescales, perhaps as short as just a few hundreds or thousands of years. This is Space Time. Still to come, NASA's Parker Solar Probe kisses the sun and indirect evidence shows the existence of dark matter around black holes. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA's Parker Solar Probe spacecraft has undertaken its 15th close encounter with the Sun. The 685-kilogram probe flew within 8.6 million kilometres of the scorching solar surface. 
The geometry of Parker's latest orbit also placed it in direct view of the Earth and several sun-observing spacecraft during its close encounter, thereby providing unique scientific opportunities for collaborative observations using both ground and space-based observatories. The European Space Agency's Solar Orbiter and Bepi Colombo missions, as well as NASA's Solar Terrestrial Relations Observatory or Stereo A spacecraft, also observe the Sun from a similar angle as Parker, but at a variety of different distances. Parker Project scientist Nora Quaffey from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory says it allows scientists to observe the same solar phenomena as it travels out from the sun into the solar system, thereby providing an opportunity for scientists to see how features change and evolve as they travel through time and space. These additional eyes on the Sun and the inner heliosphere help astronomers see the bigger picture beyond what Parker alone could do. Because Earth was in a prime position for Parker's latest encounter, the science community initiated a massive ground-based observation campaign. More than 40 observatories in the United States, Europe, Australia and Asia trained their visible infrared and radio telescopes on the Sun for several weeks around Parker's encounter. It was truly a rare opportunity, as Earth can only really view the entire Parker encounter once every three or four orbits. Now, these powerful observatories weren't able to see Parker itself. The Vansar spacecraft is far too small to be visible at that distance. But they did offer from a distance additional information about the solar sources of phenomena which the probe has been observing up close. Of course, there are several types of observations which astronomers can't get from Parker directly, such as images of the Sun, observations of the magnetic field, solar flares near the solar surface, and coronagraph imaging. Ryofi says it's an important chance to obtain different kinds of information that provide more context for the data that Parker sends back and thereby helps expand science's understanding of our local star. During the perihelium encounter, the spacecraft travelled at some 587,000 kilometres per hour. That's fast enough to travel from New York to Sydney in just over a minute. Parker was also hit head-on during the flyby by a powerful halo coronal mass ejection. The eruption, which exploded out from the far side of the Sun, is thought to have originated from a former active solar region known as AR3234. This active region was on the Earth-facing side of the Sun in late February through to early March, during which time it unleashed some 15 moderately intense M-class solar flares and one more powerful X-class flare. Solar flares are explosions of energy caused by the sudden snapping of tangled and twisted magnetic field lines known as flux ropes emanating from sunspots on the solar surface. Sunspots are cooler regions of the sun's surface that appear darker compared to surrounding areas because the magnetic field lines reaching out into space from deep inside the sun prevent some of the heat from within the sun reaching the surface. Different latitudes of the sun rotate at different rates, and that causes these field lines to become tangled and twisted. Eventually they snap and then realign through magnetic reconnection, producing an eruption of electromagnetic energy called a solar flare, which, if facing the Earth, will reach the planet in just 8.3 minutes. Solar flares are classified on the X-ray energy output, measured in watts per square metre at the Earth's orbit. There are three categories, C-class flares, which are the weakest, M-class flares, which are of medium strength, and X-class flares, which are the most powerful. Each category is ten times stronger than the previous one. Now, if the solar flares are powerful enough, they'll also eject billions of tons of coronal plasma, an embedded magnetic field frozen in flux from the sun's corona, exploding out from the sun at speeds of up to 3,000 kilometres per second, which, if facing the Earth, will reach our planet in just 15 to 18 hours. When these geomagnetic storms hit the Earth, the flux of ionised particles slam into the planet's magnetosphere and are then guided by the planet's magnetic field lines through the ionosphere, a region already filled with charged particles, and towards the north and south magnetic poles. As these charged streams of plasma travel through the Earth's upper atmosphere, they collide with oxygen and nitrogen atoms and molecules, causing them to excite and emit photons, in the process giving off a glow and producing colourful curtain-like displays known as the northern and southern lights, the aurora borealis and aurora australis. 
The colours being emitted depends on the particles being ionised. Reddish-brown glows are caused by the collision of particles with single oxygen atoms in the Earth's upper atmosphere, usually above 300 kilometres. Lower down, a greenish hue is created by single oxygen atoms down to altitudes of around 100 kilometres. The kaleidoscope then turns a whitish-yellow beige when nitrogen is mixed in with the oxygen. Aurora can also exhibit a blue, red or even purple glow in the lower atmosphere, which is caused by the excitation of molecular nitrogen below 100 kilometres. However, as well as the spectacular auroral light shows, these highly charged particles can also damage or even destroy spacecraft by shortening out their electronics and destroying circuits. They also cause the planet's atmosphere to expand and contract, thereby increasing atmospheric drag on orbiting spacecraft, resulting in premature orbital decay and the need to use up more of their fuel in order to maintain an operational orbit. Worse still, space weather increases the level of radiation exposure which astronauts experience, thereby affecting their health. On the ground, these solar storms can overheat power lines, causing widespread blackouts. Back in 1989, one such geomagnetic storm was so powerful, it blew out transformers, causing blackouts across most of eastern North America. Space weather also affects communications and navigation satellites, and it forces polar airline flights to be rerouted to lower latitudes, thereby using up more fuel. Even though this coronal mass ejection erupted on the opposite side of the sun from the Earth, our planet still felt its impact. See, as a coronal mass ejection blasts through space, it can create a powerful shock wave that can accelerate particles along the coronal mass ejection's path at incredible speeds. Known as solar energetic particles, these speedy particles can make the 150 million kilometre journey from the Sun to the Earth in just 30 minutes. Spacecraft orbiting the Earth detected the solar energetic particles from this eruption meaning the coronal mass ejection was powerful enough to set off a broad cascade of collisions that managed to reach our side of the Sun. NASA space weather scientists are still studying this event to learn more about how it achieved its impressive and far-reaching effect. This is Space Time. Still to come, indirect evidence of the existence of dark matter around black holes. And later on April Skywatch, our nearest neighbouring star system, Alpha Centauri, the iconic constellation Southern Cross, and the annual Lyrid's meteor shower are among the highlights of the April night skies on Skywatch. Astronomers have provided indirect evidence supporting the possible existence of mysterious dark matter around black holes. Dark matter is invisible. It doesn't emit or reflect light, nor does it interact with electromagnetic forces, making it exceptionally difficult to detect. But scientists know it exists because they can see its impact on galaxies, stopping them from flinging apart as they rotate. And they also know dark matter has mass because they can see its gravitational lensing effect on background galaxies by bending their light. Astronomers know dark matter makes up about three quarters of all the matter in the universe. But as to what it actually is, well that's a complete mystery to science. The new findings reported in the Astrophysical Journal Letters suggest there's a substantial amount of dark matter surrounding stellar mass black holes. The claims are based on detailed observations of two relatively nearby stellar mass black holes. The authors selected AD 620-00 and XTE J1118 plus 480 as research subjects because both are binary systems, each comprising a stellar mass black hole and a companion star orbiting it. Based on the orbits of the companion stars, observations indicate that their rates of orbital decay are approximately 1 millisecond per Earth year, which is actually about 50 times greater than their theoretical estimation, which is about 0.02 milliseconds annually. To examine whether dark matter exists around black holes, the authors apply the dark matter dynamical friction model to both binary systems using computer simulations. They found that the fast orbital decay of the companion stars precisely matches the data observed. 
Notably, this is indirect evidence that something, possibly dark matter around the black holes, is generating significant dynamical friction, slowing down the orbital speed of the companion stars. The findings support a theoretical hypothesis first formulated in the late 20th century, which represents a breakthrough in dark matter research. Now, according to this hypothesis, dark matter close enough to a black hole would be swallowed, but it would leave remnants to be redistributed. And this process ends up forming what you'd call a density spike around the black hole. The study's lead author, Chan Man Ho from the Education University of Hong Kong, says that such a high density of dark matter would create dynamical friction to the companion star in a way similar to a drag force. This is the first ever study to apply the dynamical friction model in an effort to validate and prove the existence of dark matter surrounding black holes. Chan says his study provides an important new direction for future dark matter research. Previous studies relied mostly on gamma ray and gravitational wave detections to observe the presence of dark matter, but they depend on the occurrence of rare events, such as a merger of two black holes, and that might require a prolonged waiting period for astronomers. On the other hand, the novel approach adapted by Chan and colleagues will no longer be confined by these limitations. In the Milky Way alone, there are at least 18 binary systems, all very similar to the black hole binaries observed by the authors in this study. And all of them could therefore provide a rich information source to help unravel the mystery of dark matter. This is Space Time. And time now to check out the night skies of April on Skywatch. April is the fourth month of the year in the Gregorian calendar and the fifth in the early Julian calendar. The Romans gave this month the Latin name of Prillus. Although the name's origins aren't certain, traditional entomology suggests it's from the verb apparir to open, as in it being the season when the trees and flowers begin to open as the northern hemisphere moves into spring. April is also Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Month, and so it's a good time to consider adopting a shelter pet or donating to an animal welfare charity. High in the southern sky during April, you'll find the Southern Cross and its two pointer stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri. The more distant of the two pointer stars from the Southern Cross is Alpha Centauri, which also happens to be the nearest star system to our own. Located some 4.3 light years away, Alpha Centauri actually consists of three stars. There's Alpha Centauri A and B, which orbit each other, and Proxima Centauri, which orbits the pair. And at 4.25 light years distant, it's currently the nearest star to the Earth other than the Sun. A light year is about 10 trillion kilometers. The distance a photon can travel in a year at 300,000 kilometers per second, the speed of light in a vacuum and the ultimate speed limit of the universe. Like the Sun, Alpha Centauri A is a spectral type G yellow dwarf star. It's slightly bigger, having about a tenth more mass than the Sun, and has about 50% more luminosity. Astronomers describe stars in terms of spectral types, a classification system based on temperature and characteristics. The hottest, most massive and most luminous stars are known as spectral type O blue stars. They're followed by spectral type B blue-white stars, then spectral type A white stars, spectral type F whitish-yellow stars, spectral type G yellow stars, that's where our sun fits in, spectral type K orange stars, and the coolest and least massive stars of all are spectral type M red dwarf stars. Each spectral classification is further subdivided using a numeric digit to represent temperature, with 0 being the hottest and 9 the coolest and then a Roman numeral to represent luminosity. So, our Sun is a spectrotype G2V or G25 yellow dwarf star. Also included in the stellar classification system are spectral types L, T and Y, which are assigned to failed stars called brown dwarves. These are sometimes born as spectrotype M red dwarf stars, but become brown dwarves after losing some of their mass. Brown dwarfs fit into a category between the largest planets, which are about 13 times the mass of Jupiter, and the smallest spectrotype M red dwarf stars, which are around 75 to 80 times the mass of Jupiter, or about 0.08 solar masses. 
Orbiting in a binary system with Alpha Centauri A is Alpha Centauri B, a spectral type K orange dwarf star, a little smaller and cooler than the Sun, with about 0.9 times the Sun's mass and about half its luminosity. Alpha Centauri A and B orbit each other around a common centre of gravity every 79.91 Earth years. The distance between the two stars varies between roughly that of Pluto and the Sun and that of Saturn and the Sun. The third star in the system, Proxima Centauri, sometimes called Alpha Centauri C, is a spectral type M red dwarf star, with roughly a seventh the diameter and about an eighth the mass of the Sun. It takes around 550,000 Earth years to orbit Alpha Centauri A and B. The nearer of the two pointer stars to the Southern Cross is Beta Centauri, also a triple star system, but this one located a far more distant 390 light years away. All three are massive young blue stars, far larger and more luminous than the Sun. Two of the stars, named Beta Centauri AA and Beta Centauri AB, orbit each other, while the third star, Beta Centauri B, orbits the primary pair every 1500 Earth years. Beta Centauri AA and AB are known as a spectroscopic binary, orbiting each other every 357 Earth days. Spectroscopic binaries are double star systems orbiting each other so closely and at such an angle that they can only be visually separated, from our point of view here on Earth at least, by their spectroscopic signatures. Both these stars are now reaching the end of their time on the main sequence and will soon run out of the core hydrogen they use for fusion, the process which makes stars like the Sun shine. The two pointer stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri, are named after Chiron, the centaur, a mythological Greek being half man, half horse. Chiron taught many of the Greek gods and heroes, but was placed among the stars after accidentally being shot with a poison arrow by Hercules. Next to the pointer stars is the spectacular Southern Cross, or Crux, the smallest but one of the best known of the 88 constellations in the sky. The Southern Cross is considered an important constellation for navigation and is featured on the flags of several nations, including Australia, Brazil, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea and Samoa. In April, the Southern Cross lies on its side in the early evening but becomes more and more upright as the night progresses. The bottom and brightest star in the Southern Cross is Alpha Crucis or Acrux, which is actually a multiple star system located 321 light years away. It consists of three stars, A1 Crucis, which is a spectroscopic binary, and A2 Crucis. A2 Crucis and the primary star in A1 Crucis are both spectral type B blue stars, with surface temperatures of 26,000 and 28,000 Kelvin respectively. The two components orbit each other every 1,500 Earth years at an average distance of around 430 astronomical units. An astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and the Sun, roughly 150 million kilometres or 8.3 light minutes. The spectroscopic binary A1 Crucis is thought to comprise two stars, with about 10 and 14 times the mass of the Sun respectively. The pair orbit each other every 76 Earth days at a distance of around 150 million kilometres, in other words, one astronomical unit. The masses of A2 Crucis and the larger component of A1 Crucis are expected to eventually explode as core collapse supernovae, ending up as neutron stars, while the smaller component of A1 Crucis could survive as a white dwarf. The left hand and second brightest star in the Southern Cross is called Beta Crucis, and it's also a spectroscopic binary, consisting of two stars orbiting each other every five Earth years, at an average distance which varies between 5.4 and 12 astronomical units. Beta Crucis is located some 280 light years away. The primary star, Beta Crucis A, is a spectral type B Beta Cephei variable blue star, which changes in brightness over a period of around four to four and a half hours. It has about 16 times the sun's mass, about eight times its diameter, and a surface temperature of some 27,000 Kelvin. By comparison, our sun has a surface temperature of just 6,000. The second star in the system, Beta Crucis B, has about 10 solar masses, a third companion has also been detected in the system. However, it appears to be a low-mass pre-main sequence star which hasn't yet commenced nuclear fusion. Near Beta Crucis is the spectacular young open star cluster known as the Kappa Crucis Cluster or NGC 4755. 
and more commonly referred to as the jewel box, the name given to it by famous 18th century astronomer John Herschel. Open star clusters are groups of stars which were originally all born at the same time out of the same collapsing molecular gas and dust cloud. Although somewhat still gravitationally bound to each other, stars in open clusters eventually separate, moving to other parts of the galaxy. As the name suggests, the Jewel Box is a stunning collection of more than 100 bright, colourful stars, located some 6,440 light-years away, although its exact distance is somewhat difficult to determine because of the nearby Colsac Nebula, which obscures some of the light. The Colsac is a dark nebula containing lots of gas and dust blocking out background stars. In Australian Aboriginal Dreamtime legend, the Colsac forms the head of the Emu constellation, with the dark dust lanes of the Milky Way forming the emu's body and legs. The central parts of the jewel box are framed by bright stars making up an A-shaped asterism. These are among the brightest known blue, white and red supergiants in the Milky Way. Gamma Crucis, which is located at the top of the Southern Cross, is the third brightest star in the constellation. It's also one of the nearest red giants to our solar system, located just 88.6 light years away. Although only 30% more massive than the Sun, its expanded outer envelope is bloated out to some 84 times the Sun's radius and is radiating some 1,500 times more luminosity than the Sun. As a red giant, no longer on the main sequence, Gamma Crucis is nearing the end of its life. Its surface temperature is some 3,626 Kelvin and it has a prominent reddish-orange appearance. The star on the right-hand side of the Southern Cross is Delta Crucis, a massive, hot and rapidly rotating star that's in the process of evolving into a red giant and will eventually end up as a white dwarf, the stellar corpse of sun-like stars. Delta Crucis is located some 345 light-years away and has about nine times the sun's mass and eight times its radius. It's presently radiating at around 10,000 times the luminosity of the Sun at an effective temperature of 22,570 Kelvin, causing it to glow with a blue-white hue. The smallest star in the Southern Cross is Epsilon Crucis, which is located in the space between Delta and Alpha Crucis. It's a red giant, some 228 light-years away. It has about 1.42 times the mass of the Sun and about 32 times its radius. Its surface temperature of 4,148 Kelvin means it's sometimes referred to as an orange giant. The Southern Cross is at its highest point in the southern sky this time of year and is pointing directly at the southern celestial pole. It's within the constellation Centaurus the Centaur, the half-man, half-horse of Greek mythology we mentioned earlier. The creature is holding a bow loaded with an arrow. The centaur's front leg is marked by the two pointer stars Alpha and Beta Centaurus. His back arches over the Southern Cross, and just above this is Omega Centauri, a spectacular globular cluster visible with the unaided eye from dark locations. Unlike open star clusters, globular clusters are tightly packed spheres containing thousands to millions of stars, which were originally all thought to have been born at the same time from the same molecular gas and dust cloud. Omega Centauri is about 16,000 light-years away. It's one of the largest and brightest of the hundreds of globular clusters known to orbit around the Milky Way galaxy. Centaurus was included among the 48 constellations listed by the 2nd century astronomer Ptolemy, and it remains one of the 88 modern-day constellations. The constellation Orion the Hunter is still clearly visible in the northwestern sky this time of year, with its rectangle of four stars surrounded by a central trio of stars which form Orion's belt. To the right or east of Orion is the constellation Gemini and its two brighter stars, Pollux and Castor. This time of year, the Gemini twins are almost directly due north for southern hemisphere sky watchers. The higher of the two stars, Polax, is a red giant, some 11 times the diameter of the Sun and located just 34 light-years away. The other star, Castor, is much further away, some 51 light-years. Look to the east and you'll see the star Regulus, the brightest star in the constellation of Leo the Lion. Regulus, which means Little King, is located 77 light-years away and is about 3.5 times as massive as the Sun and about 140 times as luminous. 
Regulus is a binary companion star, which takes 130,000 years to orbit the primary. To the right of Regulus, and virtually due east in the sky right now, is the star Spica. Located directly below the four stars in the constellation Corvus the Crow, Spica is the brightest star in the constellation Virgo. Also known as Alpha Virginis, it's the 16th brightest star in the night sky and is another spectroscopic binary, comprising two stars closely orbiting each other every four Earth days. In fact, the two stars in Spica are orbiting so close together that the gravitational interaction between them has caused them to become rotating epsiloidal variables, distorting them into the shape of a rugby league or gridiron football. Light from this binary changes in brightness as the two stars orbit each other, exposing their elongated hemispheres to us. Spica is located some 260 light years away and is some 2,000 times as luminous as the Sun. Spica means ear of wheat, which Virgo is holding in her hand. It's so named because it marks the start of the harvest season in the Northern Hemisphere. The primary is a blue giant variable Beta Cepheid which undergoes small rapid variations in brightness because of pulsations in the star's surface thought to be caused by the unusual properties of iron at temperatures of 200,000 degrees in the stellar interior. It has about 10 times the sun's mass and about 7.5 times its diameter. Once a spectral type B blue-white main sequence star, it's now pulsating rapidly, rotating at more than 199 kilometers per second over a 0.1738 Earth day period. It's one of the nearest stars to the Earth, which is expected to end its life as a Type II core collapse supernova. The second star in the system is also thought to be a spectral Type B blue-white giant, about seven solar masses and 3.6 times the Sun's diameter. OK, going back to the Southern Cross and looking to the right or west, you'll see the star Canopus. It's the second brightest star in the night sky after Sirius. Even though Canopus is 312 light years away, it looks incredibly bright because it's huge, 100 times the diameter of the Sun and 10,000 times as luminous. This year's second major meteor shower, the Lyrids, will peak on April the 22nd and 23rd. The Lyrids appear to radiate out from the constellation Lyra, close to the star Vega, one of the brightest stars in the sky this time of year. The source of the meteor shower are particles of dust and debris shed by the long-period comet C1861-G1 Thatcher. Sky watchers in the Northern Hemisphere get the best view of the Lyrids. However, listeners at Mid-Southern Hemisphere latitudes can also see the shower between midnight and dawn. Patient observers will be rewarded with around 18 meteors per hour before dawn from dark sky locations. And now with a look at what else is happening in the April night skies, we're joined by Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. Well, April night sky, well, we'll start with the Milky Way, which, as I always say, is our our galaxy seen from the inside. Our galaxy is like a big swirling starfish sort of thing. It's thin if you look at it from the edge on, and it's quite broad if you look at it from the top or the bottom. But we're inside it, so the view we get is either uh, sort of looking through the plane of the galaxy or looking up out of the galaxy or down out of the galaxy. So we're looking at our galaxy from the inside, and that is what we call the Milky Way. And at the moment, in the evenings, it's stretching all the way across the sky from the southeast to the northwest in the first half of the night. In the early morning hours, with the Earth having turned a bit more on its axis, you'll find that it's now stretching from the southwest to the northeast. So that's just a changing perspective as as the Earth has rotated a little bit. In the middle of the evening, this time of year, we've got the Southern Cross nice and high in the southeast. We've got the bright star Canopus, which is actually probably my favorite star in the night sky, actually. It's the second and brighter star in the night sky, and it's nice and high down in the south southwest. I don't know why Canopus is my um, favourite. I, I just like the name. I think the brightest star in the sky, Sirius, which a lot of people like, it's very high in the sky. From from the latitude of around about Sydney, it's actually pretty much overhead this time of year in the evening. So you you can't miss it. It's the biggest, brightest star that's up there. Also unmistakable, if we look around to the northwest, we've got Orion the Hunter. Now, uh, as the Earth turns, constellations that are in the western part of the sky, they dip below the horizon and other ones come up in the east. So Orion's on its last legs in terms of observing for the moment. So if you want to see Orion, get out and have a look at it this month because it will soon be gone. As the night rolls on, we've got some more famous constellations that begin to drop out of view in the in the west, like, like Orion, we've 
So we've got Taurus, the others like Gemini and Leo, they're still going to be around for a while. They're up in the northern part of the sky, as seen from mid-southern latitudes, in the southern part of the sky, if you're in the northern hemisphere. Well, they're, yeah, they're still around for a little while, but won't be too long until they dip down in the west as well and we lose them from view. I get asked a lot, actually, what constellations are. They're basically just sort of join the dot affairs with stars in the night sky. The ancients, you know, who believed in gods and mythologies and things, they immortalized their beliefs in the seemingly unchanging patterns in the, the stars and they put their figures in these join the dots affairs into the night sky. I think some a bit of them, of Vino helped as well. A bit of Vino, yeah, because I was about to say, some of them, very few of them in fact actually, uh, particularly the ones that are um, sort of mythological figures and people and animals and things, very few of them look like what they're supposed to look like. Uh, there are some constellations that do look like they... Scorpio. Uh, what they're supposed to look like. Uh, Scorpio is a good one. Uh, triangulum, which is just a triangle, which is just three stars. Uh, what else will we have? Southern oh, there's a couple cross, of ones. Yeah. Southern Cross, there's, there's um, um, that's about it. I you know, there's that a couple of couple of constellations that that, that are named after cr- like crowns, and they do have like a, a band of stars in a sort of a um, curved pattern that looks like a crown. So there's a few of them like that. Uh, Leo the Lion's pretty good. Orion the Hunter, you can sort of make out a hunter or a figure in that. Taurus the Bull, you know, I can't really get a bull out of Taurus, but you know, Leo's pretty good. You can sort of see a lion in Leo. Oh, I think I'd need more uh, Vino for that. <laughs> A bit more thick now. Um, these days, the technical definition of constellation is not the patterns of the stars and it's not the mythological figures and things in the night sky. The astronomers, basically, just uh, modern astronomers, they divided up the, the sky into areas based upon those old constellations. So they're just sort of they're just boundaries. You know, if you imagine a, um, a map of the United States or Australia or any other big country that's divided up into states or provinces, they are just literally you know, a line that goes north and it goes east and down and sort of you know like a square shape or a rectangular shape or an odd shape, but it's all made up of straight lines that go this way or or that way. So that's all they all it is these days. It's just a it's just a quaint way of dividing up in the sky into areas. Constellations have no um, scientific significance whatsoever. Constellation we mentioned before, the Southern Cross, they're quite easy to see if you have some dark skies, and I mention this term quite a lot in this program, dark skies, what do I mean by that? Basically means away from light. Most people live in suburbs where you've got street lights and house lights and things. That's not a dark sky. You know, you need to get somewhere where you're some kilometers or miles away from lights and get some dark skies where you're not being affected by the sky, the glow from the, all the lights, and also let your eyes get dark adapted. It takes about 20 to 30 minutes for your eyes to really get used to the darkness so they can pick out fainter things. So if you can get away from lights, get your eyes dark adapted, then you're under dark skies. So if you look for the Southern Cross, what you'll be able to see right next to it is this seems like a big dark patch in the middle of all this Milky Way. That's a big dark nebula that's actually out there in space, and it's called the coal sack for obvious reasons. It's, it's a coal sack, coal dark, and it's just this big, beautiful, it's quite large, this really big dark nebula, which is only really noticeable, as I say, if you get into some dark skies. Not far from the Southern Cross, also, there are two bright stars. They're known as the pointers, and these are the stars Alpha and Beta Centauri, very famous pair of stars. Alpha Centauri system is the closest to Earth. They think it's, well, there are two stars, and there's a third star called Proxima Centauri, which is the closest one, and they think they're all, well, certainly the, the two main stars of Alpha Centauri are gravitationally connected, and they think the third one is as well. And they're called the pointers because if you draw a line between them and then extend that line, it basically more or less points towards the Southern Cross. And, and the reason why that might be handy is because on the other side of the Southern Cross, there is what looks to be an even bigger Southern Cross, which is known as the False Cross. And some people see that one first and think, oh, that must be the Southern Cross, not realizing that not far away is the real Southern Cross. And probably the reason for that is that the real Southern Cross is really small. It's really, really small in the night sky when you look up. People expect to see this huge thing, but it's actually, it's the smallest constellation, I think, the Southern Cross. So that's why it's handy to have the two pointers nearby and they point more or less towards the Southern Cross. Now, let's look at the planets. There, you know, there are five planets that are easily seen with the naked eye. You've got Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. The next one, Uranus, is technically bright enough to see just as a faint dot of light if you have these dark skies unaffected by light pollution. The next one, Neptune, you do need a telescope to see. Right? And, and then Pluto, I said planets before, I, I still call Pluto a planet. It's very faint and it does require a telescope. And you need to know exactly where you're looking for Pluto or you need to have one of these fancy new telescopes that are computer controlled and will just take you exactly to the spot in the sky to see what you want to see. It won't be worth trying to spot Mercury this month. 
So if you're a fan of Mercury, sorry to disappoint you, that's it's going to be really low in the western sky after sunset and lost in the twilight, so don't bother during April. Venus, on the other hand, is big and bright above the western horizon after sunset, and you really can't miss it. It is big and bright. It's the brightest thing in the sky apart from the sun and the moon, so it should be fairly easy to spot as long as you have clear uh, clear weather. Jupiter, it had been visible until recently, but it's now lost the view because it's gone around the other side of the sun from us. It'll reappear in our pre-dawn sky out to the east next month. Mars, Mars is still around. Mars you can see in the northwest after sunset. It's northwest if you're looking from the southern hemisphere, sort of southwest if you're in the northern hemisphere. Mars just looks like a sort of a reddy, orangey star of medium brightness. Planet, of course, not a star. And the view through a telescope at the moment is disappointing because it doesn't look very big, and that's because we're well past the point of closest approach, which was late last year. As Earth is going faster in its inside orbit, Mars is going slower on its outside orbit. The distance opens up pretty quickly between the two planets. And the greater the distance, of course, then the smaller Mars appears to be because it's further away. And finally, Saturn. Saturn can be seen out to the east before sunrise if you're an early uh, early riser or, or a real late night owl. Saturn's pretty easy to see or, or easy to identify. It's fairly bright at the moment and it has a slightly yellowish tint. Most people will say that Saturn has a yellowish tint. And if you've seen a picture of Saturn, then you'll know that its cloud patterns are more sort of in the yellow part of the colour palette, whereas Jupiter's more sort of pinky, um, pinky reddish sort of colour. Mars is a sort of a sort of ruddy, orangey red sort of colour. Venus is bright white, and and so is Mercury as well. And that, Stuart, is the uh, sky for April. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 